Well, good morning, folks. Um, we're still getting a little situated here in the room, but masks off. All right. Um, I want to welcome everyone to day two. Day two of the KBUMP meeting. Um, thanks for those attending in person and virtually. Um, you know, it's a, obviously a lighter attendance than we had pre-COVID um, in the room. And uh, that's partly because the beauty of webinars that we've all realized is uh, makes it much easier to attend meetings. Um, but also the, you know, closure of I-5 a few days ago and uh, atmospheric rivers, you know, reasons. Um, but I still appreciate everyone taking their time out to uh, to attend and learn more about what's happening in the climate. Um, so we've got uh, another great set of presentations today and really excited to uh, to you know showcase those and really want to appreciate the the folks who are presenting and you know volunteering their time to uh, to help share this information. All right, let me get started with my slides. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm gonna go over a few of the things that we talked about yesterday. Um, so try not to repeat them too much. Um, we'll put this up on uh, the KBUMP website um, as PDF of the slide. So you can go back and review the mission and everything, but, you know, KBUMP was formed, um, you know, to really focus on improvement of water quality in the river, um, as well as kind of coordinate the groups that are uh, performing the monitoring. Um, and, you know, trying to make sure we're collecting high quality data, um, working together, sharing that data, making sure that it's usable by all parties. Um, and it's more of a challenge than you would, than you would think, um, you know, uh, data gets, uh, collected, you know, sometimes under different, you know, by different programs, uh, under different rules and, you know, different QAQC methods, um, sent to different labs with different reporting limits. Etc. It can go on and on, really, about how uh, you know, kind of complicated it gets. Um, but you know, the value of KBump is we hope to provide you know some commonality to those data to make it usable by all, um, and again, just try to share that information. So, you know, that's kind of the the general mission of KBump, um, and I think it's 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 been incredibly helpful for you know for most of our organizations to really improve that that data quality. Um, you know, KBUMP as an organization um, is really, you know, all about the stakeholders. So there are 17 organizations that are, uh, you know, that are on the KBUMP steering committee. Um, I don't have the number here of who are actual, the number of KBUMP organizations who are members, um, but, uh, you know, it's a it's a broad coalition of, of different groups uh, that are, you know, partnering on this, um, you know, uh, state and federal agencies, nonprofits, NGOs, um, private companies. So, it's a, uh, we really have a good, you know, a good um, connection to, you know, all the different players in the basin. Um, uh, right now we have funding through uh, July of next year from Caltrans. Um, and we're looking at some more Caltrans funding after that. Um, we're also obviously open to other funding opportunities to help, um, you know, help advance the science and uh, the understanding of water quality. Um, uh, I myself serve as a staff member from the San Francisco Estuary Institute um, as the coordinator for KBUMP. Um, about half time, half of my time is uh, goes to KBUMP. So, you know, it's not a lot. So I'm spread pretty thin at times, um, you know, working on other projects as well. So it's a, it's a challenge in, in many ways, but, um, you know, we, we do try to provide some, you know, some key things back to the stakeholders and back to uh, the basin in general. Um, uh, this is one of those, uh, you know, deliverables we have. Um, you know, KBUP meetings we have typically held twice a year, and um, they provide a great avenue for, you know, sharing information, sharing data, um, allowing people to just learn what else is happening beyond your silo. Um, we want to, you know, also help assist members uh, to get that data uh, to be publicly available, um, and often that includes getting data into public databases. Um, so we'll help uh, members with that. So if your group needs help getting that, um, give me a call. Um, we're also working on a status and trends assessment of water quality conditions in the Klamath River. Um, it is uh, uh, getting back to what I was saying earlier about all the different organizations and how they collect data. It, you know, it's more complicated than I was assuming going in, um, but it's going to be very important just to see, you know, how things change over time, um, how things change, how data, how data trends seasonally, and uh, how how you know certain parameters can change as you go from upstream to downstream. 
So there's a lot of information to learn. Um, we're uh, you know going through trying to understand all the different ways to you know the most valuable ways to to graph this data and present this data. Um, and you know given the number of parameters collected, the number of stations, uh, you know the number of years we're looking at, it's uh, it's a bit overwhelming right now. But I'm really excited to to be working on that and and help you know give that information back to uh, the larger community. Um, yesterday was uh, a day where we focused almost entirely on dam removal science and monitoring. Um, it was really interesting to hear all the different, um, you know, research and science projects that are related to collecting dam removal monitoring data. Um, we had a good panel discussion that, uh, you know, we let go a little long, but there was still so much to talk about. Um, I don't have it here on the slides, but there will be a workshop in January that um, you'll hear about from us and from other uh, emails, I'm sure as well, um, that it's going to be a two day workshop uh, at Cal Poly Humboldt that's going to talk about and try to work through, you know, that the last things we need to discuss, um, you know, prior to dam removal in terms of if there's any additional, you know, monitoring or data needs um, and just, you know, finding ways to further collaborate and coordinate our efforts. Um, today, we're going to get back to more of our typical K-Bump effort, um, which is a, a hodgepodge of, of different talks. Um, they're somewhat grouped together, um, but, you know, it's, it's a great variety of just some of the different work that's going on, um, and it's but a small example of the effort that's happening in the basin. Um, so that's going to come in the form of 11 different presentations, um, and then we'll have time at the end for open discussion if people want to just continue the conversation. Um, go through kind of just some big picture things here real quick. You know, we got, you know, that atmospheric river, there's some good rain, some good snow coming in, um, but, you know, it's a drop in the bucket um, based on, you know, the, what we've been dealing with with a multi-year drought. Um, so, you know, breaking news, but not really breaking news. We all know it's not even going to, you know, begin to get us back into a, a surplus. Um, you know, and the drought isn't just in the climate basin. Um, you know, this is, you know, one of these unprecedented droughts as we look back uh, further in time. Um, you know, the whole Western U.S. is affected. Um, it's hard to go into the news and not see a story about something about the Colorado River or other other rivers. Every, you know, there is just a, you know, a lot that we're going to have to deal with. Um, and you know, there's not many ways to make more water. Um, so, you know, right now, you know, the entirety of the Klamath Basin is in either severe or extreme drought. I'm going to minimize this here. That's a little better. Um, uh, you know, it's gotten to the point where uh, last year there was emergency drought regulations um, developed for the Shasta and Scott to protect, um, you know, listed species. So um, things that are, again, unprecedented. Um, you know, one of the drivers uh, of, you know, what's causing this um, besides natural variability um, in the weather is climate change. Um, you know, I, I kind of harp on this a little bit at each meeting. When we when we start our talks, but you know this is going to be a a, a a critical issue moving forward. Um, you know when we look at the temperature record of the of the of the Earth, each of the last eight years were the eight hottest years globally ever recorded. You know let that sink in a little bit um, in terms of the reality of it. Uh, you know when we look at okay, how are we doing? Are we improving things? Are we reducing? you know, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and currently we may, you know, we're, we're not, um, you know, methane is, um, you know, has more important effects in the short term than carbon dioxide. Um, but, you know, we're seeing the rate of increase in methane, uh, you know, last year was the largest ever increase in that rate. So um, we still have so much work to do to really maintain a livable planet. Um, and, you know, this isn't just something that affects you know, droughts like we were seeing in the Klamath Basin. You know, it's extreme weather of all kinds. Um, and how we, you know, and each of our organizations, you know, do what we do to manage resources and, uh, you know, sustain our 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 world, um, everything is different now. And, you know, we need to take that into account moving forward. You know, status quo is going to be hard to accept. Um, in terms of, you know, how that one of the impacts um, we had the McKinney fire um, last year in the middle Klamath, and, you know, it was, uh, you know, a very large fire. Um, and, you know, often in came up talks, I'll kind of talk about one 
specific thing, um, you know, that that's happened recently. And this is my, you know, my one for this talk. Um, it was kind of my, I think it's the surprise. The thing that we weren't anticipating um, is during the midst of this fire, there happened to be a very large storm that just showed up um, and uh, was basically actively raining within the fire zone. Um, uh, you know, we got reports of about five inches per hour of rain. Um, I don't know how anecdotal that was, but you know, it's it's an intense amount of rain, um, and it was very it was localized. It was very stationary. So, you know, not many um, uh, you know rain gauges showed rain, but boy, it sure hit the McKinney area. Um, so one just piece that ties back to climate change is in contacting the NOAA office in Medford. Um, they happened, you know, about just getting some weather data uh, regarding that storm. They kind of mentioned that, oh yeah, early August, we had the highest ever amount of, um, you know, moisture in the atmosphere measured above the Medford station than they've ever recorded, ever. This isn't, you know, just for that particular day. So um, they call that precipitable, precipitable water. Um, so going back to 1948, you know, that event was, was extreme in by all measures. Um, you know, that uh, rain event on the fire area caused a debris flow in three different tributaries to the Klamath. Um, you know, that uh, brought in a, just a tremendous amount of sediment. Um, it, you know, that sediment oxygen demand drove dissolved oxygen down to zero in the main stem river, which I didn't think was even possible. Um, you know, it killed thousands and thousands of fish, um, something that is really, uh, you know, relative to the approach we try to take when when there is a fish kill and going out and monitoring and assessing, uh, you know, uh, crews were not able to even get into the fire zone because of the road closures. Um, so we really, this is an estimate and that's all. Um, you know, in general, it was uh, considered that it was mostly suckers or warm water species because the main stem river is too hot during the summer uh, for salmonids. They'll seek refuge in tributaries and at the mouths of tributaries. Um, you know, so the assumption was it's not that big of a deal. Um, uh, but again, because we couldn't get in there to to, to measure and monitor and count fish, um, you know, we were making a lot of guesses here. Um, when we look at kind of those impacts, you know, turbidity levels at uh, uh, the Side Valley uh, Sound Station measured 1,500 FNUs, um, very, very high. Um, you know, stuff we don't see in in typical, you know, storms, um, you know, and that turbidity, granted it went down, you know, considerably, it, it really was a, was a peak and then a decline. Um, but, you know, we had elevated levels of turbidity, you know, for, for weeks afterwards. Um, and then once the boat dance flows came and flows came up out of Iron Gate, you know, that sediment was resuspended again. And again, high turbidity levels. Um, some of the monitoring data um, collected um, during the Debris flow um, showed, you know, very high turbidity, of course, like I said, high, elevated, you know, uh, volatile suspended solids, nutrients, et cetera. Um, so, you know, all those things add to the stressors that uh, the fish are already dealing with. Um, and, you know, by this time, the adults, uh, adult salmonids, the fall Chinook were migrating into the river um, and dealing with the, you know, the high water temperatures, all these other stressful conditions. Um, again, you know, a lot of a lot of disease impacts on the fish this year um, in the adults. And so just some, you know, some pretty ugly pictures you see of um, the fish, you know, being susceptible to, you know, columnaris and, and you know, gill, gill, gill issues and, you know, running the gamut of problems, really. Um, and, you know, because we're not able to do the monitoring, um, you know, during that initial road closure and because the water is so turbid, you know, you can't see the fish in the water. So it creates just huge challenges from a monitoring perspective. Um, but having that monitoring network uh, of, you know, the real-time gauges and folks going out and collecting samples is, you know, is critical. Um, when we look at the monitoring network, um, uh, you know, as of the last time we did this in 2020, um, we measured nearly a thousand different monitoring locations um, collected by the different entities that are out there in the basin. Um, this is not just water quality. This is all the fisheries and fish health monitoring stations, uh, you know, flow gauges, um, you know, meteorological stations. It's trying to capture everything. But, um, you know, the network is extensive. Um, and that means a lot of data uh, available. Um, 
you know, uh, the interactive map that we have uh, that has all this information. Um, you know, you can go and select certain parameters that you're of interest and and be able to look at where those locations are. Um, so here's, for example, total suspended solids and the station where the stations are located. Um, here's just another example for chlorophyll. So you can go in and select and pick any of these, you know, parameters that we've that we've captured. Um, and then when you click on one of those stations, you can find out kind of the details of who, who's collecting it. You know, what what parameter are they collecting? Where, you know, where is that location? Uh, you know, when are they collecting it? What's the seasonality to it? How frequently are they collecting this data? So there's a lot of good metadata uh, there to help you understand, you know, okay, is that capturing what I what I want um, for the for the information and data I want? Um, and then you're able to view and download that metadata. And then um, we'll have links to the organizations and the people who are in charge. And um, one thing that didn't make it into the map initially that is on our next list is uh, linking to like the real time stations. Um, and, uh, you know, if there's public databases where that data is available. So that's coming soon. Um, you know, when we talk about this network, you know, it's, it's so huge, so vast to capture. It's hard to, you know, explain much more about it. Um, uh, but you know, getting back to the presentations that we'll have today, you know, and what we had yesterday, it's just a just a small window into what is really happening in the basin. Um, you know, there's there's so many stories to tell. Um, I kind of think of presentations sometimes as as stories of data, um, and so you know, each of these stories are are important. They help you fill in the gaps of our understanding, um, and just to to be able to know how we're managing these species. Um, and you know the the river and the the ecosystem itself. So, um, you know it it gets back to when we want to see what's happening with the status and trends of conditions of fish uh, populations of recovery. You know we need this data to be able to tell us what's happening seasonally. How are things changing over the course of years? How is things changing? You know longitudinally um, as water flows from the headwaters to the mouth. So there's so much to tell. Um, from the data itself. And and so that's why I always love these cave up meetings because you hear these stories, you start to fill in the gaps, you start to understand where, you know, where we're going, where we are and and um, where we need to be. Um, so getting back to the meeting itself, you know, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. Um, you know, we, we're here to learn, we're here to learn what's happening, what's the latest science and information that um, these presenters are gonna share with us today and that we'll share through questions and answers. Um, understand these connections, you know, between water quality and fisheries and recovery of, uh, you know, habitats. There's, there's so much connecting this. Um, we can't just work on one independently and ignore the rest. Um, you know, we're also here to build collaborations, to network, to talk to our partners and our colleagues and, and learn from them and, um, you know, be able to find better ways to work together. Um, on page nine of the agenda, we have our meeting guidelines that help keep us, um, you know, keep us uh, uh, respectful. Um, and uh, we're really excited about, you know, just being able to share this information in a non-confrontational way. So uh, let's try to respect the kindergarten rules, so to speak. Uh, for those on Zoom, um, we really want to know who you are and uh, where you're with. Um, so. Uh, please go ahead and, you know, you can right click on your image and uh, rename yourself. Um, name organization would be great. Appreciate that. Um, stay muted, of course. We all know that by now. Um, and if you have a question uh, for one of the speakers, um, go ahead and put the raise your hand button and your image should pop up to the top and we'll uh, recognize you and you can ask a question. Um, if it's a short, quick question, you can also just enter something in the chat as well. So uh, we really look forward to that Q&A and that discussion. Um, we will uh, email folks a link to the uh, to a Google form, which is our meeting evaluations, to find out you know how how the meeting went for you. What can we do better in the future? Uh, we really want to take that into account and you know continue to improve KBUP meetings for for you, the user. Um, uh, where we have permission to post uh, the slides um, as well as the YouTube recordings um, of the presenters, um, we will do that to get that to the KBUP website. Um, uh, you know, there's occasions where we have uh, people from, you know, presenting data that's preliminary or it's not yet published. And so there's, um, you know, restrictions in that sense in terms of what we can share. Uh, we, we really appreciate those, you know, those presentations as well, even if we can't share the slides afterwards. Um, so thank you. You know, often that's the USGS and other groups. So uh, we really want to thank you for even presenting this, you know, preliminary data. 
Um, so we'll get the PDFs up uh, soon, and then the recordings will take a little bit longer, um, but those are also valuable to go back and, and refer to as well for you. So um, we will take a, a morning break and a lunch break, and then, um, uh, you know, take those time, take that time to try to network with people. Um, if you're joining us via the webinar, um, please go ahead and, you know, if you see someone in the in the one of the participants also on the webinar, go ahead and you know you can start up a chat with them in particular if you'd like. So, um, lots of ways to network even if you're not in the room uh, with us. Uh, anyone have any questions at all? Okay, um, I don't have the chat available. Can you? Oh, here we go. Um, I can get that open. Um, is anyone studying the impacts of exporting water to the Rogue Valley from Howard Prairie and Four Mile Lakes? Um, I cannot answer that question. Um, I know that's, I think this is kind of that historical water diversion. Um, if anyone uh, has the ability to answer that question in the chat uh, for Ken, that would be, that would be helpful. Um, thanks. Well, um, I want to get to our first presenter.